2016 has certainly been an interesting year. Britain said fuck you to Europe and went solo. The Chicago Cubs finally won the World Series after a goddamn century. An inexperienced, unfiltered glob of molten bronze took on the entire world and won, and everyone died. Everyone. But there is one question that lingers in everyone's minds. One final loose end that needs to be tied. The fate of the world depends on it. When is P.M. Rance going to release his year-end review of movies? The answer is right now. Sorry it took so long, everyone, with getting the list together, watching potential candidates, re-watching candidates to assure their place on the list, and as well as watching two entire TV shows and playing an epic JRPG for the Patreon pledge reviews, as well as my day job, as well as the uncertain existence of my future, it took longer than expected. But I wanted to make something that I felt was good, and I wanted to take my time with it, and you know, the Blizzard philosophy, it's complete when it's done. But, it's now time for me to piss off the entire internet by committing its one cardinal sin. Expressing my opinion about movies, especially ones that I didn't particularly like. Let's do this. Number 5. Finding Dory. You know what sucks about growing up? Realizing that your favorite art medium is, in fact, a business. And you realize that certain properties exist because they're more of a capital investment more than an artistic endeavor. Look, I get it. Finding Nemo made a shit ton of money back in 2003 and Disney wanted to keep that gravy train going. I won't say it was too long for a sequel to come out. If anything, it was probably the best time to release it from an economical perspective seeing as how Nemo has become nostalgic. Additionally, a good deal of people who saw the first movie as children now have children of their own. Disney and Pixar were confident that Finding Dory would be a surefire box office hit, and they were right. It made over a billion dollars and even outgrossed Frozen in the US, which makes it all the more unfortunate that the film is kind of forgettable. It could very well be possible that I remember Finding Nemo so well because I watched it dozens of times on Stars during my summer vacation in middle school due to sheer boredom, but honestly, I did my best not to let my nostalgia for the original cloud my judgment for the sequel. But Pixar did its damnedest to elicit those nostalgic feels. Recurring characters, recurring jokes, recurring themes, all saying, Hey, remember the first movie? We had that too! This could have possibly worked if Dory went on the adventure solely on her own, because I felt that Marlin and Nemo were just there to be there for sequel's sake. Visually, it looks absolutely gorgeous, but it's Pixar, they have the money and the talent, so it's expected. But the story isn't particularly engrossing and the humor has more misses than hits. I don't think it's awful, Pixar has certainly done worse, but this was clearly a sequel made because it was a solid money maker. If you have children that love this movie, then by all means, let them love it. But it's just going to be a hard lesson for them to learn, especially if Pixar decides to make another film within the next 15 years, that it just goes to show that if you love something, they may want to continue on it, but just for the reason that you'll spend money on it. Number 4, Rogue One, a Star Wars story. I suppose the same thing I said about Finding Dory could be applied here, but it seems as though they may have tried a little harder with Rogue One, but it also had a lot more shortcomings in its delivery. For instance, Jin Erso was marketed as this fearless badass who took no prisoners, but she actually doesn't have very much to do outside of being a plot device. In fact, pretty much everyone fits easily into an identifiable archetype instead of being developed characters. The snarky comic relief, the battle-hardened best buds, the adoptive mentor, you know the score. As with other problems, the first half of the movie throws you around to like four different locations in a short amount of time. The dialogue can get pretty hammy, even for a Star Wars film. Despite the CG for pretty much everything else looking terrific, they couldn't quite get it down for some particular characters. You know the one I'm talking about. And that was even more awkward because I saw this on the day Carrie Fisher passed away. And given the context of the story, I wasn't really incentivized to care about the characters because of what eventually happens to them. They all die. There are some good elements to this flake. The final battle is really fun and the setting finally looks and feels like an actual war. And despite the fact that Darth Vader is only in two scenes in the entire movie, there is one instance that reassures fans why he is one of the greatest villains in cinema history. That seems to be a trend with Gareth Edwards. 
make an absolutely standard and passe film sprinkled with nuggets of absolute brilliance. Maybe he should stick to making short films. Number three, Passengers, also known as Stockholm Syndrome, in, in space. space. Without giving away too much, I'll just say that Passengers is certainly not what I was expecting. Instead of a sleek, admittedly cliched space survival romance, audiences got a relationship drama built on a morally reprehensible decision, which could have been an interesting concept and would have created a lot more discussion if done a different way, but nope, it had to abide by Hollywood bullshit and test group feedback relying on the bankability of the industry's hottest stars. I love the production design and the idea of being isolated on a cruise ship in space, Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence are fine with the material they're given, but that's the biggest problem. The material. This movie's script went unproduced for almost 10 years and had the opportunity to explore the circumstances and repercussions of the big decision that is made which is really the driving force of the entire film. Instead, it does a piss poor job trying to validate said decision and falls victim to the cliches that people like myself grow tired of really quickly. But it seems that opinion is rather small compared to who I've discussed the film with, saying that they really enjoyed it, especially the romantic aspect of it. I'd say that those people haven't really taken the time to put themselves in that situation. If they really thought about it, they wouldn't be happy about the decision that was made, even if the person who made it was as handsome and charming as Chris Pratt. If you're really curious to see what I'm talking about with passengers, I'd say you can justify that curiosity with a rental or streaming and discuss it among your peers. But the movie itself doesn't really explore the very question it asks very well, and the end result isn't anything special. Number 2. Hardcore Henry. Now this was something that I was excited for. The premise that it was done entirely in first person instantly had me sold. It was based on a short film, and now that I've seen Hardcore Henry, it really should have stayed that way. The only thing the film has going for it is its gimmick. And let's just face it, the first person perspective is a gimmick to try to sell tickets and it wears off after the first 30 minutes. Even less than that if you suffer from motion sickness, you poor devil. What's left is a pointlessly complex and convoluted plot involving clones and remote projections sprinkled with saving the damsel in distress that you'll forget about in a day or two after watching. I found the acting to be exceptionally dismal, especially from Charlotte Copley, and I understand. This isn't the kind of movie where acting shouldn't be at the forefront, but in that setting, it's better to be forgetful than annoying. Even with all the superb stunt work involved, the lack of any compelling motivation behind the stunts other than for it to look cool wore out on me pretty quickly, and I was ready for it to be over sooner than it actually was. Films that are really action and stunt showcases do need style and substance throughout the whole thing, even during the quiet moments in order to keep the viewer invested. This is where Hardcore Henry fails as opposed to where something like John Wick succeeds. And the moral of the story? The theme that audiences should take home with them? Be a man! Don't be a pussy! You Russians sure like to keep things simple, don't you? Before number one, the obligatory honorable mention sequence. Sully. I understood the intent behind trying to tell the story in the format it was, but Clint Eastwood's direction had a few moments that didn't really go anywhere, and essentially repeated the same set piece twice. Captain America, Civil War. I thought it was okay, but best superhero movie ever? Not even the best superhero movie of the year. Hacksaw Ridge and Silence. I put these two on the same slot because they're both very similar to each other. Both are set in Japan, both star Andrew Garfield in a role with strong religious conviction, both are uncompromising with their brutality, and both are getting a little more praise than I think what I personally think deserves. Sausage Party. The movie itself was okay, but I later learned that most of the animators who worked on it were treated like shit. Thankfully, I didn't pay to see Sausage Party, and now that I'm aware of what happened, I'm not going to put any money into it now. 2015 taught me to keep my hype in check, so 2016 didn't really provide a lot of instances that truly let me down. However, it took a special kind of bad to be number one on this list. In the words of Dewey from Malcolm in the Middle, I expect nothing, and I'm still let down. The biggest disappointment in 2016 for me was not just one film, but the DC Cinematic Universe. All of it. <sighs> they just don't learn, do they? I know that some of you may be thinking that I have some sort of inherent bias against DC because I'm constantly putting their movies at the top of my most disappointing films lists year after year, 
But that isn't really the case. I want to like these movies, I really do, but DC is constantly shitting the bed with their directors, writers, and their inability to stay thematically consistent. Say what you will about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but at least it has a plan and sticks to it. DC is currently going through an identity crisis because it can't decide to be dark and gritty contrasting to Marvel, or follow in its footsteps because Warner Brothers is more concerned about getting people to see these movies rather than making the movies good to begin with. I'm not going to talk about Batman v Superman much because everyone and their mother have already dissected every single butt-fucking frame of the movie, but I will say it did a haphazardly infuriating job in setting up this universe. It was clearly more concerned about what was going to happen three movies from now rather than the goddamn project they were currently working on. Folks are praising Ben Affleck's performance as Batman, and while I admit that it could have been worse, the material that he's given is characteristically flawed and inconsistent. Same thing applies to Lois Lane, Lex Luthor, and Superman with what little he actually does. People will try to defend the movie by saying, well, if you read the comics, it'll make a lot more sense. I'm sorry, but no. The point of an adaptation is to abridge the source material into a cinematic experience. That's why these movies exist. They are not just for comic book fans, they are for everyone. And if knowledge of the comics is required, not encouraged, there is a difference then the movie has failed, objectively. Then there's Suicide Squad, which is a whole new clusterfuck in of itself, already showing signs of trouble with the polarizing reception of Jared Leto's Joker, we'll get to him later, reshoots five months before the film was due to release, and the decision midway to make it more fun. Because that shows confidence in your product, right? This kind of movie is supposed to place its emphasis on the diverse ragtag group of characters. Too bad most of them are awful or practically given any screen time or development. Will Smith is Will Smith, and as I've said before, Will Smith is mediocre. Margot Robbie is trying her best, but I personally always hated Harley Quinn as a character. Viola Davis gives the only good performance in the film, and she's made out to be an unlikable bitch. It seems as though the studio knew that Cara Delevingne couldn't act, so they put her in a skippy outfit and had the director tell her to belly dance while someone else voiced over her and everyone else has absolutely no investment value put into them, so they could really just be stand-ins and we would be none the wiser. And then there's Leto. I'm in the minority here, but I believe that this is the worst iteration of the Joker ever. Jared Leto is trying way the fuck too hard, and he comes out sounding like Marlon Brando tripping on morphine while trying to give his best Pee Wee Herman impression. I really didn't care if anyone lived or died during the already uninspired action sequences, which is supposed to be the meat of the film, and the editing... Holy fuck the editing is bad, especially at the beginning of the movie, not with just cut simply deciding to provide exposition through text because there was already enough being jammed into our gullets. And like Batman v Superman before it, it had to shoehorn the aspect that this is all part of some greater universe and artificially implants anticipation for upcoming films in the future. Even though it made a metric shit ton of money overall, there's a reason why there's such a humongous drop in the second weekends and afterwards. Despite making over $800 million, Batman v Superman is still considered a financial disappointment. Because, even though it may have the undying allegiance of DC Comics and DC movie fans, the more casual moviegoers and more dedicated film lovers like myself were burned by its exquisite banality. And that's the secret to a lot of movie success. Because it's not dependent on everyone seeing the movie but a smaller circle of people who love films seeing it more than once. And that's something that the DC Cinematic Universe and Warner Brothers need to recognize if it has any chance of sticking around. I'm PM Rant, and although I've already sworn off seeing anything else by Zack Snyder, also known as the Canadian Michael Bay at this point, I'm kind of curious to see the Justice League movie just to see how he'll fuck that up too. Thank you for watching. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and I need to give an especially big thank you to Sean Campbell, Sam Peters, Michael Perry Jr., Kodo Sinclair, Todd Pasilik, Connor Pierce, William Fletcher, Kestar24, Will Stonehouse, Nicholas Blackman, Q Player, Jackson Smith, Mitch Jackson, Dak Gore, Ethan Parker, Juan Lanez, Mario Maracuin, Rodolfo De Lara, you son of a bitch. Ramona Viking Hansen, Cynical Carlos, and Michael Drew. 
If you haven't seen my video about the movies that disappointed me the most this year, the link will be in the description. Thank you all for watching, and more videos to come.